everybody, a warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the place where we're diving into the deeper meaning of life and asking the big questions. I'm Janneke and today I have the highly respected spiritual teacher and author Søren Hauge on my show. Now, he has worked extensively with Theosophy for more than 30 years and he has been leader of the Theosophical School in Denmark. In the later years, he has moved into other directions too and he actually had his own spiritual breakthrough when he found and developed Soul Flow, which we will learn more about today. Hello, Søren. I'm so excited Hello. to have you. How are you? Wonderful. I'm great. I have been really looking forward to this because I know you have a vast knowledge within spiritual concepts. You have been working with this for so long and I really want to learn more about what theosophy is today because that is something I don't know much about. Uh, I looked it up online and I was like, okay, I think, you know, this is my, um, my, that this could be my thing, but I want to learn more about it. But also what really interested, uh, interested me was your journey because in Denmark, uh, it seemed like through interviews and stuff like that, I've been doing some research, you were kind of put on a pedestal and you were this, uh, Theosophical Encyclopedia, and from what I understood, you didn't feel comfortable in that role, and you felt that you didn't have a balance, but then you discovered Soul Flow, which was this breakthrough for you. Yeah. So I'd love to hear about that story and what happened. Well, I would love to, and I think it's important for me to start by saying that my spiritual journey started when I was a small boy and I should go back to my a the age of five to give a, a feeling of why my journey became such a an intense awakening uh, when I was about five years old on a summer vacation with my parents in southern Germany I was shown the royal eagles, golden eagles circling in the sky above. And for me as a little boy, only five years old, to see these majestic beings up there in the sky was in fact my first spiritual awakening. It was it made such a huge huge impact on my consciousness that I didn't know what to do with myself. Uh, this feeling of freedom, of grace, of majesty, high up above was the beginning of my journey in this lifetime. And for many years, I didn't know what I should do with it. So I thought I should become an ontologist, which, which means uh, an expert in birds. Hmm. Because I didn't know anything about spirituality. And then I started writing poems. I was about 10, 11 years old later on, and I was writing poems when I was in nature. And I was all alone with this spiritual longing. But I didn't, I was not able to talk with people about it. So it was when I was 17, and I have to uh, emphasize that I was quite a social guy so I had good relations in in school and I was well respected and I was the funny guy in the class and and people liked me but I lived a double life I had an inner spiritual yearning that I couldn't speak with people about and then I had an outer expression and I was a nice guy and I did well in school but at 17 I stumbled upon the word theosophy in an encyclopedia at home. I was still living at home. I had not moved from my parents. But just seeing the word theosophy was such a deep recognition of something that I knew about. Hmm. So I grabbed the phone immediately and called the um, uh, information uh, to try to help me 
can I find something in Denmark with the word theosophy? And I got a number and I immediately phoned and talked with an elderly lady who was so nice and very gentle and kind with me. And I felt at home immediately. It was like finding the first family member of a lost family. And it led to that the following summer, my parents gave me as birthday present on my 18th birthday um, to attend a summer course in theosophy. So that summer I met about 70, 80 people from 10 different countries, mostly Danes, of course, but also people from other countries. And it was an indescribable feeling of coming home to family and to be together with people that I could speak the same language with about reincarnation, about, about auras, about a deeper meaning of life. And you're a, you're an immortal soul on a journey. And I went as a meat eater and I returned as a vegetarian. So my parents were quite shocked about what was going on, not because it was a creed, but because I felt better uh, with this more light energy in the vegetarian food. And coming home after this experience, which was amazing, uh, it's, I'm really lost for words because my happiness in finding a fellowship of people was um, beyond words. And my very first intention was I need to share with others. So at the age of 18, I started reading theosophy, this wisdom teaching, and reading was recognition. It was not, oh, aha, I see. It was, wow, yes, I know. So it was an immediate recognition. I could go so far to say, I am absolutely certain I was a theosophist in my last <laughs> life because it was like taking up the thread and continuing exactly where I, I left it the last time. So it was amazing. I was so. going to mention that because I heard you said that in an interview and I always find that fascinating. Uh, at the same time, I've been doing some interviews with some people who talked about parallel lives. So I'm always wondering, is it past or is it parallel or, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I feel very sure I was living in the beginning of the 19th century. And I have personally met the Theosophical pioneers. When I saw the, saw the pictures of Ledbetter and Annie Besant and Blavatsky and others, Jeffrey Hudson and so on, I and Krishnamurti, I felt immediately this huh. is family. I know these people, and that's the reason why I was able to start teaching Theosophy after one and a half year. And I mean, I simply plunged into starting a study group in my town, Aarhus, here in, in, in Denmark, and in Jutland, Denmark, and I didn't hesitate a bit about anything. I just plumped out into it, and people were attracted, and I was, um, of course, I was very enthusiastic, but and I was very young. I think that was my main obstacle. I was 20 when I started uh, teaching, and... Wow. Um, normally, in the beginning, I had to uh, talk a little bit with people so they, they forgot my age, really, because then we could share the, the central issues. And I very quickly started on what we call a Danish evening school. We have something in Denmark called evening schools for adults. And I uh, advertised via this evening school company. And it only took uh, a few years. And then I had about 100 students uh, <laughs> per week on five different classes in my town. And it was magnetic. People were talking about it and it was expanding. And I was 
using all my energy on this and i knew that this has to be my uh, had to be my my the work of my life your mission do. yeah i mean that's everybody's dream it seems like or well, not everybody but at least like <laughs> finding your mission you know that you just feel like you're home and you experience that like this is me and it comes so natural exactly uh, but then uh, i think it's very interesting to hear that actually you developed and have found new directions too absolutely but it's important to uh, to understand that this was the beginning of a journey within the theosophical organizations in scandinavia and in total i dedicated three decades of full-time service in the theosophical environments and it's very important to say that it has been a blessing and it has been an absolutely amazing learning place uh, and also it has been a very important part of my spiritual family but there's also a but in this because if i put on my my uh, karma hat and 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 say It was also a meeting with a past with unresolved conflicts. So I also gradually, I very quickly became, I was seen as the coming man. I was seen as this is the guy who will bring theosophy in Scandinavia and perhaps the, the entire world. I was told that by clairvoyants and, and you know, very oh. well informed people. You can become leader of the Theosophical movement in the world, uh, in the Theosophical headquarters in India, if you really will this and choose it and so on. And I was surrounded by people who saw me as a kind of oracle and I was told, oh, when you speak, there are light beings surrounding you and your aura is amazing. And you and, believed in it also, maybe, at that time? In yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. of course. And, and you know, it was very, very difficult for me to to keep the balance in this, uh, in this, uh, air, in this mm, land of expectations. Mm -hmm. And I felt at home, but at the same time, I felt that I was gradually being strangled by these perceptions and how I should fit into the theosophical expectation. Yeah. So it, and also there was a lot of personal conflicts within the theosophical uh, organization and mm -hmm. it was growing amazingly. But at the same time, there were many unsolved issues on a personal level and I felt more and more bad about it. And at a certain point, I was actually threatened Uh, that if I didn't really follow the codex of how to do it, you know, uh, it would oh. have, have severe consequences for me. Whoa. And that was... Red flag. Point. What? That's a red flag. It was not even a red flag. I immediate, It was in 1988 and I immediately um, decided to leave the Theosophical uh, Organization I left it immediately and I continued teaching on the evening schools and with lectures and, and, and weekend courses, but I detached myself and it took about one and a half year and then I was asked to come back very politely uh, because they needed me and I told them, okay, you are my friends, but you are also very... Uh, demanding and uh, my condition for returning is that I am allowed to be me as I am so it was a kind of you know um, um, version 2.0 uh, mm -hmm. for me in the theosophical environment because from then on I kind of made my new agenda in a new way and that gave me some kind of freedom uh So before we go into the, uh, you meeting soul flow and uh, what yes. happened uh, within you, I feel like I have to know, like from my own curiosity, <laughs> what theosophy is, because now yeah. like I have all these concepts in my mind. But 
Yeah. What is it really? Uh, yeah. What is it? Yeah. Well, what is it? <laughs> Theosophy means spiritual wisdom. If you translate the word, it means divine or spiritual wisdom. And it is the name of a spiritual movement that started in the uh, about, about 1875. Uh, and it is a movement that has had a tremendous influence on everything we call New Age and holism and new spirituality. Um, it was founded by a Russian uh, lady called uh, Helena Blavatsky, and it attracted many, many people, especially in Europe and America. Um, it's not a religion. It's not no, a religion. No. It is a spirituality, but it has been organized within the theosophical movements and circles around the world. It is a very free and open spiritual, spiritual movement, but every spiritual movement develop, develops its own inertia and its own dogmas. Right. You can, I have never met any spiritual movement that has not developed any kind of rig, rigid systems or you know uh, hmm. here we do it like this so it doesn't need to be any kind of a religion but it can easily develop into a belief system that becomes a prison for people yeah. in the long run so theosophy in itself is spiritual wisdom about we as spiritual beings on a spiritual journey, uh, unfolding our nature through reincarnation, karma. Uh, we have our energy fields. When we die, we leave the physical plane and go into other dimensions. And this wisdom, the existence, is existence of angels, uh, teachings in diverse kinds of energies and how we develop and how we evolve, uh, from sleeping to awakening. And all this, theosophy stresses the very important point that this kind of wisdom has been available for all ages in all cultures in different ways. So you could say it is a kind of expression of something that is belonging to humanity, but in many different dialects, in different cultures and ages. And to put it very shortly, and I know this for a fact, theosophy is the most important single spiritual movement that have, has paved the way for what is called new age and holistic values and okay. new spirituality. So it's quite a significant thing, really. I didn't know. So it kind of uh, sprung out from there in a yes, way. Yes, and, and, and okay. the, 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 the fact that that so many people in the Western world today believe in reincarnation and karma as a natural thing and even th think it's no big deal to combine with Christianity and things like this. It is mainly because of theosophy that has made it normal. Also to talk about chakras and auras and so on, it stems to a great degree from theosophy. And theosophy uh, also has a is deeply rooted in Indian teaching and other traditions, but the theosophical organizations themselves yeah. is one thing, and the core of theosophy as such is mm -hmm. another thing. I, Was yeah. it like that uh, you, you meant some codexes that they include something, but some things they don't believe in? And if you maybe perhaps are open to that, it's like, no, we don't believe in that. Yes, or certain kinds of interpretation of how you deal with chakras. For instance, oh, okay. there is a very widely spread um, understanding in classical theosophical circles that when we deal with the seven chakras we normally don't talk much about the root chakra and the sacral center and the solar plexus because they sort of belong to the personality level so oh. we try to start from the heart and upwards and that's a big problem i see where you're headed because yes, then you're you not grounded that, right yes <laughs> because 
I was, I had all the time a sense of there's something wrong here, not about theosophy in itself, but about how it is being interpreted into a kind of, you could call rigid, old fashioned Western style. We have to overcome the personality. We have to lift us up mm. and leave the lower things and transcend into the higher things. And oops, this is really not very holistic. If we take that path, we risk ignoring very important parts of our daily nature and our subconscious. And we play a game that we call holistic and wisdom, but wisdom in its full depth has to embrace the subconscious and the personal level of our existence. If we just talk about transcending, transcending and the higher and the higher, then we are actually in denial. We are trying to escape from a very important part of reality. And that's the story of myself, because when years went by, I discovered that I was not able to meditate myself out of my problems. I was not able, via the theosophical interpretations of the wisdom, to deal with my real problems, because the way the wisdom was practiced was kind of wisdom with no feet. It was the wisdom with wings and eyes gazing upwards, upwards but there was not su sufficient um, skills and willingness to deal with the pers personal level and the subconscious. And I became trapped in that and I became very, very unhappy. And in the end, I felt that I was kind of a hypocrite mm. because what I was trying to teach, I was not able any longer to deal with in a sufficient manner. And it was very, very painful for me. So in 2007, I made a turning point. And in a way, my departure from my responsibilities in the Theosophical Organization stopped, uh, started, started to stop. It, it, it finally stopped in 2012, but I kind of phased it out from 2007 because I felt I needed to be honest with myself and I needed to stay completely authentic with the people I was teaching. And I have to stress very clearly this is my story. I'm not judging anything because the many people who are engaged in the theosophical circles are doing brilliant work and theosophy is also evolving and changing uh, in Denmark and other places. I'm just telling my story and for me it became absolutely adamant that I gave my goodbye to my theosophical identity as an ambassador for theosophy, uh, uh, and I started discovering who is Soren? Who am I really? And who am I as a spiritual teacher? And I was very lucky and fortunate by provi uh, divine providence, of course, that in 2011, I, ha I have a very close friend, Kenneth Sorensen, and I've been collaborating with him for many, many years uh, since before the millennium. And he is a, a very skilled uh, psychosynthesist, psychotherapeut, and um, a, a psychotherapist. And in our collaboration, he was very, very good at um, sharing with me how he experienced my 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 own traps my own uh, um, difficulties and together we started a journey in 2007 with developing a new energy psychology and ways to renew spirituality and this is an ongoing journey um also today 
And then in 2011, a, a, a shared colleague that we have as a friend and a colleague, an American spiritual teacher known uh, uh, as Gordon Davidson, he offered to teach a group of international people uh, and learn them his method of working with the higher consciousness and the deeper consciousness in the subconscious and the daily consciousness. And he called his uh, work uh, several things. One of the names was Joyful Evolution. He also called it Multidimensional Psychology. And to make a very long story short, I jumped in and said, yes, Gordon, I'm ready for teaching because I knew immediately when he started talking about it, that this was a very, very gentle approach to the subconscious. And I felt it was like, here is the answer to my longing. I'm finally able to meet a, an esoteric, a spiritual, theosophically grounded colleague who is working with a new approach to the subconscious. So I started uh, as, so, as just yeah. a question was were you very aware that I have these subconscious uh, programming or programs that I yes. can't really just uh, stuff down like yes. they're coming up and they're haunting me in a way because I can uh, I, I feel like I understand what you're saying like uh, you're supposed to be this or, or that and then you feel like but it's not I don't feel balance is still and you still may be attracting the same things and you're like what's going on here why am I, I attracting that absolutely and um, I think the best example I can give of how I felt it when I met it because he sent me he sent me some notes to writings he was making about his approach and he asked me to give feedback and for me, just to read was, even just to read was he, what, he, what he was writing, it was like a gentle golden rain falling from above down into my, to the underground of my own being. And I felt a deep sorrow and gentleness at the same time, like, oh my God, I have rejected such precious parts of myself in the deeper part of my nature, the subconscious. It's like I have abandoned a whole city of valuable people down there and I need to reconnect with these rejected outcasts in my own nature. It was deeply moving and I was so touched about it, even just reading about it such a deep deep impact did it have so i talked to my wife and i said i think i need this training with gordon and she looked at me and she says i think you are very right because she could feel how it impacted what impact it had on me and she could also feel what it could mean for our marriage and our journey together because I had really, at that time, I had been doing some things to change my life uh, and also to heal past wounds and things I had neglected in my role as a father and as a husband. But she saw the potential and felt it immediately. So to put it very shortly, I started the training in 2011 and one year later, um, we were a group of 25 people from eight countries who completed the training with Gordon. And after this year, I had had so such deep inner uh, transformations and uh, connections with my subconscious that my, my entire life has been deeply changed since it made a huge in, huge impact in my marriage it speeded up my healing process with my two wonderful girls because i had neglected them in my spiritual capacity as a, a very very busy spiritual teacher in my early theosophical years and now i could really make some deeper healings with my daughters and it was 
an amazing feeling of kind of um, returning to a full role as a mature man. I really felt I became an adult man who could stand on my own feet and tackle my problems with maturity and not like a, a tiny boy whining and, and, and complaining about uh, his inability to, to transcend uh, into something higher. So It's so powerful and, that you're sharing this because uh, I, I, I think it's brave because I, I would assume that it's also a bit scary for you because you have been teaching so many people this and that about yes. theosophy and then all of a sudden coming out with this story. Yeah, I mean, yes, but you, you, ha you, you're very, you're, you're correct that it has needed a lot of courage. But I very, very quickly discovered that people's reaction when I was sharing my story. I have to say, I, I, I started sharing my story when I was, when I had traveled to a certain extent with this i kept it f for myself until i was sure that i could really share something and not just premature start talking about it so it took a little while a year or two but then i discovered when I, people people felt it when they met me they they really experienced that my expression my presence was different and and they became very moved by my story. So the fact that I told about my, about my own in, inabilities and my own, own shortcomings as a spiritual teacher mm -hmm. was where, very was giving them trust mm -hmm. because this was something to believe in and they could see for themselves. And as I've said many times, please ask my wife. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I mean, I have nothing to hide here. It is uh, as it is. And I here I am in 2007. The, yeah, I think it's about the times we, we're living in too, because uh, I have all, always or for a long time been uh, spiritually interested. And I've seen a development that we didn't talk that much about a subconsciousness and shadow work. Uh, and now shadow work is this huge thing. Like yes. a lot of people know about it. And that's part of what you're talking about. I assume it that is, you, you can call it shadow work. Yes. And even before we had, you know, the gurus and everything. And I was there. I went to India. I was putting the spiritual teachers on pedestals. And that was in 2011. And now I don't do that anymore. And when I think back at it, I'm like, why did I do that? I mean, <laughs> I have the power power within me, but I didn't see it like that then. No, I did. No. <laughs> no, but I, I, I think I think th this is a very valuable learning process for you, because uh, by by making this change, uh, you have a very important story to share uh, like I have. And um, uh, for me, it. I mean, I've also had chances to meet some very uh, huge spiritual uh, teachers. And um, my own journey has been that I felt that if I was kind of putting my validity into uh, I have to meet this teacher in order to be a very good person myself, that is falsehoods uh, in, in, in a way. So... I have met some wonderful teachers. Absolutely, I have to say that. But but um, I I have to add that in this entire process, Kenneth and I we were invited to esoteric conferences, to spiritual conferences in USA, and we were actually invited as guest teachers, and it was an amazing discovery because here we came two Danes from small Denmark. And we have a lot of inferiority complex in the Danish psyche because we are a very small country and we're just Danes, but the huge Americans yeah. and you know, all that stuff. We um, have the same, I think. <laughs> exactly, I, I guess so. But we made some wonderful discoveries and, and I'm talking about this period since 2007 and uh, to, 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 until today. And what we discovered was that we were received with such 
warm appreciation for the teaching we had to offer. Uh, our main offerings was at that point in energy psychology and our ways of renewing this was our main offerings at that point, but also looking at the esoteric theosophical concepts in new ways. Um, and the wonderful thing is that we really felt that we were received with deep appreciation from colleagues all around the world. And a very important thing, thing we were met as equals. That was There was no feeling that we were small Danes and they were the huge esoteric spiritual colleagues from the big, big world. Actually, at, at our, this is a joke, but it's, it's true. Um, we, we went home uh, after participating in three uh, yearly conferences and we were called the Great Danes. <laughs> and I, f I find that funny because it's also a name of a dog, you know. But, but, uh. but the, the point is that it, it was the way that we were appreciated for our uh, genuine authenticity as spiritual teachers. And it was a huge upliftment for us because we discovered that we are, uh, we, we are very accomplished teachers and we don't have to com completely compare with international standards because we are what we are, actually. So tell us a little bit about, uh, I know we, uh, we have to go soon, but tell us a little bit about uh, Soul Flow, because I think people yeah. are very interested in hearing <laughs> a little bit more about what this technique or yeah. method or what you call it is. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. transformed you. Yes. Uh, we received the training from Gordon and from there on, we refined and developed it. And we call it soul flow because we would like to honor that we don't call it the same as he has been doing because we have kind of developed it into new areas. And he's very okay with it and, and very appreciative. So there's no tensions at all there. He's, he's happy that we have developed it further and, and, and have taken care of it in our way. But um, soul flow is a wonderful healing therapeutic method where everything is guided in a meditative state. So you have like, when I practice, when I, when I have my clients who come for soul flow sessions uh, with me, we sit in front of each other and then we have an initial talk about what is the problem. And, you know, the, the, the initial process is about um, zooming in and finding out what is the most important thing to take up. And let's say... It is about fear. It could also be about anger or sorrow or frustration, whatever it is. Let's not just talk about fear. Some kind of fear. I'm very frightened when I come in situations where I am becoming very visible for many people. Then I, I try to hide and, um, you know, become invisible and I'm scared. This is my problem. Okay, then we say, all right, so in this soul flow session, could we agree that we will make a loving and appreciating contact with the fearful part within you? And we call this part a sub-personality because it is a part of our total uh, nature. So it is a kind of entity within us because it is a living part of us this inner part this fearful part is a living part of our mostly subconscious that has its own story so what we do in soul flow is that we there is an initial guidance we, we, with closed eyes we uh, relax and then we open the heart and the light in the heart. And then we open up to the higher consciousness. And it is done in a specific way, inviting the light all the way down. 
And then the light continues down into the body, down into the legs, down into the earth, and we connect with earth and all good below, the, the, the peacefulness and the caring from the earth, and invite it up into the body and up to the heart. And from there, we open the heart and let it sort of melt into the stomach area and from there, from the solar plexus area, out into the whole world of the inner subconscious. And we embrace the inner subconscious with a gentle, caring, loving presence and hold the subconscious as a very, very precious gift. And this gentle holding is the kind of opening into the subconscious. And then we very gently invite that part, which here is the fearful part, to be so warmly welcomed into a guest, guest uh, a, a kind of becoming a guest in a, a warm room of appreciativeness and just allow itself to show itself how it is with no restrictions and this invitation we learn how to help the, the person to invite this inner part and from there it changes into a dialogue we're still in a meditative state but then there is a, a dialogue going on between me and 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 the the client the person and when the contact starts, sometimes with a feeling, sometimes with bodily sensations, then we invite this part to become more present, appreciating it, and then we engage in a dialogue. And this dialogue is, first of all, making this part allowing it to share exactly how it is and how its mood is so it can tell its story. And sometimes, you know, this part within, it is like standing over there in a the corner in the room. It has received the invitation, but it's very frightful. It's, it's really, it's almost in panic, but it has received the, the, the invitation and it's over there in the corner and it says, do you really think I'm invited? I, I'm in a terrible state, you know, and, and we have this, it's okay, you can stay there over in the corner, it's okay, just relax, what can I do for you? And the, the point is that we invite the person, the client, to have the dialogue. So it's not me who is telling the client, uh, the subconscious, it is me helping the client to have his or her gentle meeting with this part. And what happens is that when a subconscious part, let's say the fearful part, when it really discovers that the person here coming with this gentleness and this heart full of light and offering a gentle space and a big listening to what is going on, something huge starts. Because so often we never come to that point that we give unreserved ears and space and heart and listen to this part. Not telling it what to do, not saying you have to come into the light and I send you a lot of light and you have to transform. No, 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 stop, please. Listen to this part. Let it share what it is full of and gain its confidence. What is so wonderful and what I've experienced in my own inner is it is deeply moving when you really make such a part be heard and it becomes full of willingness to come into a greater room, but it has to tell its story. Because the interesting thing is that this fearful part, it has a story about 
why it is scared. It seems like uh, inner child work as well. Uh, I yes, mean, absolutely. I've uh, been working with that a lot and it seems like, you know, that side, you can call it different things. But to me, I picture this little child like wanting to tell her story. Absolutely. <laughs> and the inner child is one of the key sub-personality aspects that we work with. It's a key major factor and often very very soon it is important to make a contact to the inner child because it is such a precious part of our subconscious mm. but it's it's only a part of the subconscious we have a we have a whole metropole of of facets of of living inner subpersonalities we have our inner mother we have our inner father we have mm. Uh, mm. our strong willed parts we have our stubborn parts we have our optimistic parts we have our inner dancer we have our very analytical mm. parts we have our cri critical parts we have our doubting parts should i really believe in it? we have it. and you and you're saying that these are like entities or energies in a way that live it, in us the, it's a very crucial key understanding that all these parts have to be treated with the same dignity as as I should treat you as a personality, as a person sitting mm. in front of me. And that's a huge thing because it's not a program that we are kind of rewinding a program. It's not a reprogramming because that's that's not meeting something with dignity to say you are just a program you i have to d download a new program in uh, and you have to yeah i have to fix I myself yeah it's no fixing right it is a deeply appreciative meeting mm -hmm. of these inner parts and meeting them with the dignity and that's a it's almost unbelievable what it what it does with people because when they start doing this tears try to start running you know and they are so deeply moved because they have never really done it and i mean i've had i've had many many hundreds of sessions with wonderful peeping sitting in front of me and rivers of tears have been flowing from people in relief and in you know wow the it is so amazing that i can meet these parts within me and it's not just you know sensitive women who are weeping it is huge men who are really uh, discovering the gentle parts of themselves and there are so many kinds of subpersonalities we have within and they have to be met in very different ways. So, for instance, if you have a very powerful inner sub-personality full of anger, you have to deal with that and meet it in a in an appreciative way and give it possibility. But I uh, am, I have a skeptical, not, not a skeptical mind, but I have a mind that's saying, but this and but that, uh, because I've been <laughs> doing a lot of this work and I can imagine if I was trying this, I would perhaps react like this like i would meet my inner anger and i would be like but i don't i mean i like you sometimes but still i don't accept you fully and i don't <laughs> think i will like i have resistance towards it uh or yeah. maybe something worse than that maybe jealousy or something like that that's a part i don't like yeah. you know i'm and uh, do I need to like it? I mean, I, I feel it, like I still would have resistance to it. Yeah. I would maybe make a room and all that, but I would still feel like, but I'm not really liking you. I completely get what you are saying. But first of all, your big heart and your conscious presence can easily embrace this part. I'm talking not about Yannicka's daily um personality level i'm talking about when you have your my higher heart. consciousness my yes and and remember we invite this hmm. larger higher aspect okay. to be part of this so you come to this part with yeah. a gentle embracing heart you you come to this sub personality with your gentle embracing embracing heart and as a soul flow guide it is my task to 
learn you not to approach your sub-personality with the usual uh, business as usual. And that's my, uh, you know, my task is to learn you to approach this part so you don't repeat what you have been doing thousand times. And, and a very important thing is, let's take an angry side. If we have an angry sub-personality, this anger, you don't need to, it's not about loving the anger. It is about understanding this anger has a reason. And when you understand the reason, compassion awakens. And when the subpersonality experiences that it is met without judgment, it is allowed to express its anger and tell the story of why it is angry. Then something happens because then the deeper nature of this subpersonality awakens because behind the anger there is great power okay. and this power is not angry it is something that has until now only been able to express itself with anger but it is a much greater light so i help the subpersonality in the client to release the inner light that this subpersonality has behind the anger so but, there's always a light behind every personality yes, okay absolutely every personality has a heart of light that comes from your consciousness because it is within you and everything that is alive within you has its own light the only thing is that this light has been hidden by the structures of this subpersonality that tries to survive with this agenda. And that's why it's not functioning. So it's releasing in a way. Release. Yes, it is. Why? It is a liberation of the subconscious, um, of this subpersonality. So when a subpersonality is really released, the former angry, destructive subpersonality becomes a guardian of your inner power. Just to make an example, what wonderful thing isn't it that you have a kind of transformed aspect of yourself? There is, you could call it a guardian of power. So you are more empowered in your daily work. I mean, this is just an example I've give, I'm giving because it takes all different kinds of forms. But, but you know, it could also be that this angry subpersonality really behind all the anger, there is a desire to care, but it has never felt that it was able to care because it was not met. So it became angry. But now when you have met this anger, it melts into Oh, I would so much like to care for things. And then you say, but you are very much invited, invited into my greater being as a caring aspect. And we can have this friendship of caring. I need you actually, because I need some more care in my life. Would you like to be part of that? Yes, I would. But does the anger disappear? Uh, I mean, the energy, when it is met, and the story is heard, it dissipates because, I mean, there's no need any longer for this anger because it has been heard now. But don't you so, ever feel angry? Yeah, 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 because as you and I have a metropole, a city of subpersonalities within, of course, we don't yeah. deal with all anger just by meeting one Okay. okay, because it's one anger, it's not anger itself. It's I, I mean, that's a huge task. Okay. So let's just say <laughs> that you release a part of your nature okay. belonging to anger and okay. it makes you more easy to connect with anger the next time because now you have dealt with an aspect of anger. And this means that you are more friendly disposed to anger and it's not completely impossible the next time yeah so it, of course it's a journey yeah 
Awesome, Søren. Uh, I know we could go so deep here. Uh, I, I get I so many questions, uh, but we've been going on for an hour. But thank you well, so uh, much for sharing Theosophy and your journey and soul flow. Uh, uh, it's an incredible story you have, and I'm so happy you shared it. Uh, I believe in sharing our stories. I think it's important because then important. it makes us uh, more brave, and then we uh, can inspire others to do the same and learn from them. So I love that. So thank, thank you so you much. much. Thank you. Uh, thank see you. you. See you. And thank you so much for watching, guys. And rem remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't before. Much light from Denmark and Oslo. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.